Hello, creatures! Welcome to my first ever Q&A. You know, I've been doing this channel for a long time, and it's occurred to me that I've never given a proper Q&A video. My live streams for the longest time have acted as sort of Q&As on their own, so I thought it would be cool to try something different. So without further ado, let's get to the first question, which is from one of my Patreon subscribers. Thank you for your tangible support. It'll go to a good cause. How do you feel the music you listen to contributed to who you are as a person today? And how do you think your life would be different if you never discovered this part of yourself? Well, when I was younger, I used to listen to hip-hop, pop, uh, a little bit of country music sprinkled here and there. And when I was really, really young, I liked boy bands. Um, and eventually, I just couldn't connect musically with any of it anymore. I also couldn't connect musically with people around me. Uh, the classmates that were around me, they listened to rap music, but they didn't listen to the rap music I was listening to. The adults around me, they listened to rock music, they didn't listen to rock music I listened to. So, I also was getting a lot of grief from these people, just based on what I was listening to. And if I expressed myself, they smiled through their teeth and said that they supported me. They didn't. And eventually, that led me to the conclusion that no matter what I listened to, I was going to face grief from people. So I decided I was going to listen to what I wanted to listen to, everybody else be damned. Eventually, I would discover a little subgenre known as death metal. Some of you might have heard of it. And what death metal does by spirit is encourage individuality. You know, even within its own subgenre. You know, obituary doesn't do blast beats typically like emulation would do. And there were bands like Dystopia where the politics and their messages and their lyrics would influence my thinking of the world and, um, you know, it changed my worldview. You know, because bands like Dystopia, they challenged racism and environmental problems and political issues and all sorts of other stuff. So that started my path to how I think today. And as far as the music goes, it also allowed me to become a better musician because I was already playing guitar, I was already playing bass, and I just started playing drums when I got the Terrorizer album, World Downfall. So when I heard these albums, I was like, man, how can I do that? So there you go. Uh, my life would be different in the way that I probably wouldn't be as much of an individual. I would probably also be stuck in rather narrow worldviews. So. I would like to thank metal music and punk music and goth music and industrial music for opening my eyes to that type of thing. And also, those genres I just listed, it's music that's made by misfits for misfits. Like me! You know, I'm not going to fit into the mainstream world. That's, that's just not for me. P.S. How long did it take for your hair to get to the length it is? Okay, so I'm 28 now. I started growing my hair when I was 14 years old. And my hair would be longer than it is currently, but the problem is that over the years I've made the unfortunate mistake of going to a couple of stylists who messed up my hair. For instance, there were stylists who, when I asked them to take off the split ends, they would take off three or four inches. There was another stylist who I asked to thin out my hair, and her idea of thinning out my hair was to take a strand, like this, cut it here, and leave it among the long strands. Now, isn't that silly? What I started doing was trimming my own hair. Not only does this save me money, but it also means that I can trim it as often as I want. There's also a bit of a stress reliever in that responsibility because I don't have to worry if the person behind me is an idiot and is going to mess up my hair. If I mess up my own hair, that's on me. So. In the last couple years, I've started taking better care of my hair. I've started using velvet pillowcases. I've been washing my hair less often, and I've been using more conditioner. And this has worked out pretty well for me. Where did you get your YouTube channel name? Well, Killbot is a ghoul character. Gorgor is a guar character. Check it out, you can see Gorgor right here. Basically, when I was coming up with a name for the channel, I was thinking maybe I wanted the idea of two monsters fighting teaming up. You know, it sounded badass. It had a nice ring to it. Uh, maybe it's shot me in the foot over the years because when I tell people my YouTube channel name, they tend to look at me like a deer in headlights. So maybe something shorter and simpler would have been nice, but you know, I, I just, it sounds cool. You know, I'm representing two of my favorite bands in one 
name. Where do you draw the line on separating the art from the artist? Well, quite simply, I'm not into Nazi bands. I don't mess with Nazis, period. Um, I don't care how the riffs are, or how the production is, or how heavy the songs are. I don't mess with Nazis. Now, as far as other allegations go, if I wasn't there, then I can't confirm whether or not many of these things happened. And there are a lot of things about the music industry that the average public doesn't know. Um, all the time you get members having feuds and disputes with other members and other bands, and there's really no way to tell unless you were there. And so most of the time, unless it affects me directly, I don't care. I'll keep listening to it. And besides, it's not like you know, all of my friends and all these people who say, oh, well, you know, they did this, they did that. It's not like the bands they listen to are perfect people. When did you begin to make music in the first place? And what are your influences for your music in general? Okay, so I've been playing guitar since I was about 10 years old, and I started recording myself when I was probably about 12. Um, I had a guitar teacher who introduced me to a little program called Audacity. And he said that this was a way that you could record by yourself with many different tracks. Uh, naturally, these songs were not good at all because I was 12 years old, didn't know what I was doing. But over time, I kept at it. I learned new tricks, learned new techniques. My songwriting got better. And we have great songs like Crossed Wires, which I just put out. Go check it out. As far as influences, it really depends on what I'm listening to currently. Um, Guar is always a big influence because, you know, Dave Brockie, he always had this thing where he would try out anything regardless of whether he thought it would work or not, and sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't, but, you know, it was the spirit of art. It was the spirit of music. It was the spirit of creation. That's why I love Guar. Let's see, Nine Inch Nails, of course, always an inspiration throughout my life, probably my favorite band of all time. And, you know, Trent Reznor, he did everything, you know, he did things on his own terms, and he was unstoppable. You know, when people shit on him for, you know, bringing industrial to the mainstream or for quitting drugs or for continuing past the fragile, even though a lot of fans don't like some of the stuff past the fragile, you know, he didn't care. He just kept plowing on through. And, you know, that's, that's the sign of a real musician. That's a guy who loves to make music. And that's me. In the case of songs like Cross Wires, you know, there's Dystopia, there's Mick Gordon, uh, those sounds influence that song. For Downstream, you have all sorts of different influences, uh, Skinny Puppy being one of them, but when I was singing for it, I was actually trying to model Trent Reznor on The Becoming, not necessarily Nivek Ogre. Do you upload your videos outside of YouTube? No, but I probably should. I'm sure that might help my reach, just a little bit. Especially since YouTube's algorithm does a pretty bad job of pushing me out there, even to my subscribers. You know, it's weird, you know, I do videos on random topics and those videos end up getting more views than my damn music videos. I don't get it personally, but whatever. What was your worst experience ever going to a concert? I would have to say that was Hatebreed, Dying Fetus, Code Orange, and there was one other opening band. Um, I was actually there just to see Dying Fetus because I'd never seen them before, and Dying Fetus did great. The problem was that the audience were just beating the shit out of each other the whole night and I didn't feel safe, so I had to watch the show from outside the venue, through the door. And of course, Hatebreed kept stopping the songs every two to three minutes because people were fighting, and Jamie was being so damn whiny about it. He was going on these minute-long tirades about, oh, insurance, and you know, bands get sued for this type of thing, and fuck fighting, and you guys need to be nice to each other. I was like, shit, man. You know, even when I was in line for that show, I looked at the audience, I looked at the line, and I was like, you know, this is a little different from the typical death metal audience. Any plans on doing more album-centered videos like the Ministry series? Well, for years now, I've wanted to do one on Skinny Puppies The Process, so I would love to get to that one. How was your introduction to metal? How has your experience changed much since then? Okay, so my introduction to real metal. Real underground metal that wasn't Metallica, wasn't Pantera, or any of these mainstream bands. Um, back in Christmas uh, 2009, iTunes added their own metal section to their store. And in that section, there was a sale called None More Black. And they had black metal albums, typically from Norway and Sweden. 
and I sampled these albums just to hear what they sounded like, and I was like, oh my god, this is the music I've been looking for all this time! So, the first black metal album that I ever bought was Dark Throne, A Blaze in the Northern Sky. It just so happened that night in Philadelphia, I was staying with my mom for Christmas, uh, there was a big snowstorm. And we were supposed to go to a friend's Christmas party, so what we had to do was put on these big snowsuits, and we, like, Lord of the Rings style treaded into the snow to this friend's Christmas party. And all the while, I had Darth Throne, A Blaze in the Northern Sky, playing in my headphones. Imagine hearing In the Shadow of the Horns while you're knee-deep in snow. I couldn't have asked for a better introduction to black metal. Yeah! Favorite Dying Fetus song? Also, what annoys you most about pop music? Intentional Manslaughter. That album turns me into a maniac, but that song especially... Ugh. And what annoys me about pop music? Well, um... The excuses people make for it, I think. For how uninspired and unoriginal a lot of it sounds, and also how bad the lyrics are. Hey, I'm a musician, okay? I pay attention to stuff like this. What slash how was your first exposure to Typo Negative? Check it out, I'm wearing my Typo shirt today, in fact. Uh, well, there was a sexy lady I was talking to on Instagram, and Typo Negative was her favorite band. I didn't start listening to Typo Negative until about 2018, me and her were talking at the time, and, um... Yeah, I started buying those albums, and I started really enjoying them. And then by the time I got to doing the Typo Negative video in October of that year, I fell in love with them. I was listening to them so much, and the research I was doing on them just made me love them even more. I was more curious about their lives, and about the scene around them, and how they influenced music, and their own influences. They're still one of my favorite bands. Would you consider coming back to the Twin Cities? I think you mean Minneapolis. And yes, I would love to do so, because when I was there last, I didn't really get to explore. I just went straight to the venue from the airport, and had a fucking great time at the Lords of Acid show. But, um, yeah, typically when I travel, I do like to explore and check out the food and check out sites and get to meet some of the people. But, unfortunately, I didn't really have enough time to do it that day. And that's okay, because I was there to see Lords of Acid, so I had a great time doing it. First band slash musician that you met in person. Uh, well, my grandpa was in several local bands. He was the only musical guy in my family. But if you're talking about famous bands, um, I would say John Cook from Napalm Death. I saw them back in 2015. They were the second death metal show that I ever saw. And John was talking to people and taking pictures with people after the show. And that was really cool. You know, I always loved Napalm Death. What's your hair care routine? Okay, so you see this? Pick. Start at the bottom. Work your way to the top. I also use velvet pillowcases, and that's soft on my hair, so that means that it's not breaking so much when I sleep. Um, personally, I wash my hair once a week. I use Odell shampoo and conditioner because that's one of my favorite YouTubers, Angela Benedict uses. I also use Cantu leave-in conditioner after I get out of the shower. I also use a protein treatment um, in between shampoo and conditioning. So. You know, it's, it's a lot softer, it looks a lot better than it used to, and it's not as fluffy. Like a kitty. <laughs> What's the best and worst band you've ever seen live? Best? Nine Inch Nails, no question. Worst? Um, probably Buzzo, and when I saw them a few years ago, apparently that lineup had only been together for two weeks, and they only had time to learn new songs, and they didn't play any of the stuff from the 90s. Now, that was a big established band. I'm sure that I've seen local bands that did far worse, but off the top of my head, as far as big bands that I was... I had high expectations for them, and they sucked, man. Are there any albums you're looking forward to in the coming years? Now that Agaloc is back together, you know they're gonna make new music together. They say, ah, oh, well, we might, we might not, but you know they're gonna write some stuff. I look forward to it. And are there any bands that you dropped because of members having ties to certain national socialist beliefs, like Destroyer 666? Uh, fun fact, I got to see Destroyer 666 a long time ago. That was on their tour with Watain. And when I saw them, I wasn't even aware of all the stuff that people were saying about them, so... I saw them, and I loved the show, had a great time, and didn't feel guilty about it. Um, I did hear from people who met them after the show that they were dicks, but <laughs> that's another story. Um, admittedly, their political ties kind of, um, 
steer me away from their music a bit, but there aren't really that many bands that do that for me. Uh, generally, I stay away from Nazis. Now, if one member or one former member has Nazi ties, like, say, Craig Pillar from Incantation, that, um... That doesn't really bug me when I listen to Incantation, because he hasn't been with them since probably the 90s, so it doesn't bug me that much, you know? Guilty pleasures, stuff that you normally don't bring up, but you're into. Well, you see, if I have pleasure, I have no guilt. Um, I do listen to a bit of Trip Hop, I do listen to a bit of Shoegaze, uh, Massive Attack. I've been listening to a lot of Bjork lately, because I like her arrangements, I like her synth lines. And her last album was about mushrooms, so that appeals to me. <laughs> um, I love Tori Amos, I love the Gorillas. Um, I have a Charles Mingus album in my collection. So, um, when I was in college, I took a course on jazz. So, yeah, there are some jazz things that I like that maybe I haven't heard in years, but, you know, I, I'm reasonably versatile. <sighs> What's the weirdest thing you've encountered while traveling? Okay, so there are two ways that I can answer this question. As far as weirdest thing, I can tell you the spookiest thing, which is visiting Roz Williams' grave, and I can also tell you about the strangest personal encounter I had, which was in the same cemetery. Um, I'm gonna tell you about Roz Williams. Um, Roz Williams was kind of hard to find. He was in the Chapel Columbarium, and nobody was in the building the whole time I was in there. So I sat there for a few minutes, just paying my respects to the godfather of goth rock, and I could hear all the echoing from my voice and my footsteps, and the whole place looked like something from a Phantasm movie, so... That was the only grave that I ever visited where I got spooked. And that was when I traveled to Los Angeles to go see Skinny Puppy. While I was in the same cemetery, I was visiting Johnny Ramone, and I asked a gentleman to take a picture of me in front of Johnny Ramone's grave. Well, he was he was wanting to connect me from beyond the grave with Johnny Ramone. And he was saying, okay, close your eyes and just imagine. Imagine hard that you're talking to Johnny Ramone and face his direction when you do it. And I was like, okay. So I did it. And the only reason I did it was because my wallet was in my backpack. So I, I, if it wasn't, I would have thought the guy was gonna rob me. But I did it. Okay. Are you thinking? Yeah. Are you thinking hard? Okay, I'm connecting you to you with Johnny. Johnny says you're a real rock and roller. You carry the rock and roll spirit. Here, smile for the camera. So. Do you like any sports? No. When I was younger, I used to go to ECU games because I liked the tailgate parties, but I didn't so much like the games. So I went to the games for a little while, but I got bored with them. So eventually, I just went for the tailgate parties because there was a lot of Mountain Dew there. And eventually, I got bored with the tailgate parties and started staying home. Music's always been my thing. Any advice on how to get myself out there? I'm doing social media stuff, but I feel like I'm lacking. What have you used for getting your name out there? Uh, mainly just consistent posting is going to be what makes you grow on social media, as well as posting things that people want to see. So... You know, don't post a million pictures of yourself. You know, nobody likes people who are full of themselves. Um, you can also post to certain audiences. So say if you're a Nine Inch Nails fan and you have a bunch of Nine Inch Nails CDs that you're posting, be sure to put Nine Inch Nails in the hashtag. And as far as what I've used to get myself out there, it's mainly been word of mouth and also word of mouth from the bands that I talk about. So. I've been talking about a lot of bands over the years, and what's helped me and my channel grow is these bands reposting my videos. So that's been really nice. And me, I have to not act desperate when I do these videos about the bands, and that helps. You know, that leaves a good impression on them. You know, I'm not gonna be some douche and say, hey, can you please repost my video? Nah, nobody likes being asked to repost and share things on their page. So yeah, just be cool. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Just keep on pressing forward. Favorite place you've traveled so far? New Orleans. Not even a question. I would move there in a heartbeat. You know, I know a lot of people who don't live there and have never set foot in New Orleans are gonna say, oh, well, New Orleans is full of crime. I love the architecture. I love the food. I love the culture. I love the music and the metal scene there. It's, it's just a great city in general. You know, I, I feel really at home when I'm there. I like Denver. I was only in Denver for about nine hours. I enjoyed that place. I'd love to explore it more. 
If you could have given yourself one piece of advice when you were younger, or when you first started your channel, what would it be? When I started my channel, well, one thing I would say is, get a shotgun mic. Or use the Yeti mic more often. That way your audio doesn't sound terrible. You also need to start compressing your audio, so that way it's more of a consistent volume throughout. Uh, one thing is also color correcting. There are a lot of things that I do now that I didn't do when I started, and when I watch those old videos, and that's a rare occasion that I do, but when I do watch those older videos, I think to myself, I should have color corrected here, I should have edited differently, I should have done this, I should have done that, but the thing is, I don't watch my videos after I upload them. Usually, I'm on to the next project, and it's always moving forward. Outside of Fight Club, what are some of your favorite movies? Also, have you seen The Doom Generation? Look, you fucking chunky pumpkin head, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> Rose McGowan was a force of nature in that movie. Yeah, Fight Club's one of my favorite movies ever. Um, I'd say the Evil Dead trilogy, specifically Evil Dead 2. That's probably my second favorite movie of all time. And I'm looking at that stack of movies over there because I keep messing this take up. Um, Back to the Future, A Clockwork Orange, Blues Brothers, Tim Burton's Batman, The Crow, Django Unchained, Rocky, This is Spinal Tap, The Outlaw Josie Wales, uh, Shaun of the Dead, Scarface, Return of the Living Dead, Predator, Mulholland Drive, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Ed Wood, uh, Natural Born Killers, Mom House, also known as Metalhead, The Lost Boys. I'm sure there are a bunch of other movies that I've forgotten that I'm going to come back and be like, why in the hell did I forget? Oh yeah, Clerks. But yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of movies over the years, so it's to be expected. As someone who has created content for the internet for close to a decade, what are the differences you've noticed between the time you started posting content and the current era? Differences in attitude from other creators, differences in your desire to produce content, and even differences in the style of content being created. Uh, well, the YouTube landscape was different back then, uh, and the algorithm works differently, and therefore you also had a lot of YouTube styles and YouTubers that were doing things that they wouldn't do now because it's not profitable. I've never been too concerned about profit, I've been more concerned about just self-expression. Um, a lot of these channels, they do it as their full-time career, and they've got kids that they gotta take care of, and they have to worry about censorship and sponsorships and all sorts of other stuff. And that also dictates what type of stuff that they upload, so that's why you have a million videos on fucking Metallica. Seriously. And, you know, sometimes people get angry because they want their small and unknown band to get reviewed and to get pushed out on YouTube. And the reason a lot of these channels don't do it is because they know it's not profitable. And for the record, these channels that talk about Metallica every five minutes, they hate doing it. But they feel like they're pigeonholed and that they have to do it. Now me, I feel like I want to make art for art's sake. And in the beginning, you know, there was, well, and even now, there's no channel like my channel. My channel's always been recreational. It's always been kind of a boardwalk of different ideas, different things I want to do. And in the beginning, people were like, oh, Killbot's cringe, oh, his humor, yeah, blah, blah, his voice, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? Now there are several channels that, you know, they've tried doing videos like I would do them, and they'd imitate my humor, they would imitate my script style, and, well, you can try to be me, but there's only one Killbot. Um, in my case, I just like doing what I do. Besides making music or making videos, are there any other ways that you express your creativity? Well, I take pictures sometimes. Um, I guess you could call it dancing creativity, so when I'm at Goth Night swaying in the darkness, that would be a creative outlet. Would you ever do a video about Roz Williams and his various projects? I feel like you'd do it justice. I would be interested in the idea, though I feel like I don't really know about Roz and his life enough to do it the way I feel like it should be done. You know, I feel like if I'm going to do a video like that, I need to be knee-deep into the knowledge and lore of what that guy was all about. And I love Roz Williams, I love the stuff that I've heard, but I feel like I need to read a couple books and listen to some more of his projects. How do you grow your following on social media? Love your content and thought about making a YouTube channel as well, but no idea where to start. So at the time I started uploading, I wanted to see video reviews on Autopsy Vinyl, Bolt Thrower Vinyl, Carcass Vinyl, Obituary Vinyl, and there weren't really videos at the time of any of these things being shown on YouTube. 
So I decided to fill that void myself because I knew that there were other people like me who were collecting records from these guys that wanted to know. So that's originally what the channel was envisioned as, was just the angry video game nerd, but for metal, because I'm a giant James Earl fan. Um, and generally how I grew the channel was I just kept at it. I kept talking about these bands in ways that nobody else was talking about. And there was one video I did, it was Seven Churches versus Scream Bloody Gore, which was the first death metal album. That got posted on Reddit and that video exploded in popularity and that brought people more to my channel. So for me, it's all about posting the right links in the right places at the right times because you don't want to bug the shit out of people with spamming of your stuff. So yeah, just keep at it. And if the bands see your videos and they like it, sometimes they will post it on their own page, which is nice. What is one band you used to love, but after seeing them live or meeting them personally, made you no longer care for their act? I've been fortunate to not have to deal with any dickheads when I met any bands, but also because I'm not really one that has to meet everybody. I also try not to be demanding when I meet these bandmates. Sometimes I just want a handshake, sometimes I want an autograph, sometimes I want a picture. But I also know how to read the room, so if I see that somebody's busy, I don't bug them. If I see them talking to somebody else, I don't interrupt. If I see that they're probably not in a good mood, I don't approach them. So. So far, so good. Any chance of a Killbot CD? I'd love to have a physical copy of your music. So you're one of the few people who actually listens to my music. <laughs> well, um, there is a chance that there could be Tales from the Tube on cassette, but it would be Tales from the Tube, the tape. So all the music that I released ever since digitally putting out Tales from the Tube would be on the tape. Uh, Lemurins, Downstream, Crossed Wires, Visiting Seth Putnam's Grave is gay. Uh, maybe I would do like a limited run of about 300 tapes, and in that case, with the math I would do, I would only have to sell about 70 to break even. But as far as CDs go, uh, maybe I could do some deal with a label or something. I've had a couple people expressing maybe wanting to do it, and I would be open for it, but, um, you know, talks never really progressed past, hey, we should work together. Okay, uh, what do you want to do? Radio silence. How do you deal with negativity that may come from big numbers on social media? Okay, so 99% of my comments are cool, nice people. And the other 1%, which is what a lot of people remember, those are the assholes. And for me, if it's on YouTube, it's one thing because at least they left a comment, but also their comment fuels my video. It puts my video out there in the algorithm, which means more comments, more views, more of that sweet, delicious ad revenue. So people may say dumb shit and I will make fun of them because you know, I, I gotta respond to it. Sometimes I'll let it set. Sometimes I'll be cute with them and be like, ha you have a small penis. But <laughs> Now on Instagram, I can't really make any money, but you know, if something of mine gets a lot of views and I get a lot of negative comments, it's usually coming from a place of jealousy on their part. See, if somebody focuses a lot of their time hating on a channel or hating on a band or a person, that says more about that person than it does about, say, me. So I'm not too worried about it. I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do, and if you don't like it, you don't have to watch. I do have a rule, though. Um, I don't start reading my comments until after I've had my morning coffee, because I've had mornings in my early days where I would read negative comments and it would make me feel shitty for the rest of the day. And that sucks, you know? But if I've had my coffee, if I've showered, if I've gone for a run, and then I read the comments, it's like I've already put a couple of hours of my morning behind me and I'm more equipped to deal with that type of criticism. What are some of the worst concert etiquette violations you've ever seen? Uh, I can't really think of any in particular. I'm just not really a big fan of that crowd killing, hand waving, arm swinging bullshit where people are punching each other in the face and kicking each other. I, I'm just not into that at all. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to defend it, and hey, if you want to get punched in the face, go for it. I just want to see a show. What's the luckiest you felt being able to go to a gig? For example, the band doesn't tour the United States much, or they've broken up, or they've changed their sound, and that you're glad you got to attend the show when you did. I am so thankful that I got to see Skinny Puppy when I got to see them because they're no longer with us, and I miss them every day. Um, Nine Inch Nails in Cleveland, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction show. That was awesome. 
They eventually had, I think, nine people on stage with them. So what happened, it was a regular Nine Inch Nails show, but for the last few songs, they brought out all the people that, well, many of the people that they played with in the 1990s. So Chris Brenna, Charlie Clouser, Danny Lohner, Richard Patrick. Dude, they played Hey Man, Nice Shot by Filter. I lost my shit. I still can't believe that show happened. It's the best show I ever saw, so yeah. What's your favorite genre outside of metal or industrial that people don't expect from you? Um, I'm not sure exactly what people expect of me, but um, I took a course on jazz when I went to college, so I used to listen to a little bit of that. Um, I used to listen to a little bit of blues. Um, you know, I'm big into goth music. I'm, I used to be big into punk music. I still like rock music quite a bit. Um, I've been listening to a lot of Bjork lately, so, you know, a little bit of trip hop, a little bit of shoegaze here and there, like Cocteau Twins, love that stuff. Um, I'm reasonably versatile. Like, my main genres are metal, industrial, goth, but, you know, I, I do venture outwards from time to time. What's the rarest thing you own? Well, that depends on your definition of rare. Um, I have plenty of CDs that are out of print. I have autographs from band members that don't really put themselves out there that much or haven't toured or are dead. You know, like Dave Rocky, I have his autograph somewhere. Um, here's something you can't buy in a store. A jar of Ogre's Brain Confetti from the Asheville, North Carolina show. And also, here are Oliver Adams' shoes from the Lords of Acid tour that just ended. <laughs> he just he just handed those to me. He was like, I'm gonna throw them away, but if you want them, I'll autograph them for you. So, yeah, that's how I ended up with Oliver Adams' shoes. Nice. <laughs> what is your process for songwriting? Generally, when I think of a riff or a drum idea, usually I'll take out my phone and I'll record what I'm thinking. And sometime later, I will put it all together. Um, sometimes the songs I write, they depend on what I'm listening to at the time, so... Last summer I was listening to a lot of Swallow the Sun, and that created limerence. Though I did have to avoid listening to Swallow the Sun for a while because, well, I didn't want to rip them off. Um, around the time I made Downstream, I was listening to a lot of dark wave, a lot of industrial, namely Skinny Puppy, and... I had just gotten the synthesizers uh, Hydrosynth Explorer and the Behringer Pro 1. And so I, I basically just wanted to experiment with those a little bit. Uh, most of the time the drum line comes first, sometimes the guitar line. I play by the Entombed Left Hand Path playbook, which is... it's full of great riffs. One great riff after another, after another, after another. Not one bad riff on that whole album. And that's what I'm aiming for when I write songs. You know, I don't want there to be a meh or okay riff in the middle of the song. I want the whole song to be full of great, awesome riffs. And getting the baritone guitar helped with that because it's so fun to play. It's fun to play these cool textures and grooves and great sounds that I can get with it. What other genres do you want to explore and make songs for? Are there any limitations that keep you from making them? I think the biggest limitation is, since I'm doing multimedia with YouTube, I want to make sure that there's a music video for each song that I put out, and unfortunately, coming up with music video ideas is kind of difficult. There was going to be a music video for Limerence, but I couldn't figure out what to do for nine minutes, and so the music video idea was scrapped. You know, I think the song stands on its own, and it doesn't need an ill-conceived, rushed, weirdly thought-out music video. Um, I'd like to make more synth music, I'd like to make more industrial, I'd like to make more dark wave. Um, the Hydrosynth Explorer is one of my favorite instruments ever, so I would like to do some stuff with that. Um, I'd like to do some stuff like Agaloc, where they're doing that intellectual, elaborate, gray metal type thing, you know, where it's a mix of different genres. How many times do you listen to an album before solidifying your opinion? Also, are there any genres out there you'd like to get into but haven't for one reason or another? Uh, for me, it's not so much genres as much as it's bands. Um, you know, like, I'm into shoegaze, but Jesus and Mary Chain, they kind of bore the shit out of me, so I don't know. Um, but as far as how many times I listen to an album, it really depends on the album. Like, when I listen to an album, I hope that I will want to come back and listen to it again. So it may take weeks, it may take months, it may take years, but, you know, you grow with the world around you, and the album stays the same. It doesn't matter what happens in the world around it the album will always be what it is. And so there are some albums that I just don't like as much as I did when I was younger. There are some albums where I like them more now than I did when I first heard them. Um, 
And there are other bands where I listened to them and I thought, ah, oh, what's the big deal about this? And then over time, I became borderline obsessed with them. <laughs> uh, some of the Lear Skinny Puppy albums I didn't like when I first heard them, but over time, they're solid albums. Even Handover. You know, I used to not like that album, but the more I listened to it, the more I was like, you know, this is, this is working for me. So sometimes it's the first listen, sometimes, um, sometimes the best albums you'll hear are albums that you hate the first time you hear them, but the more you listen to them, the more they reveal themselves, and they grow on you like some sort of fungus. Um, do you collect anything else other than vinyl and CDs? Um, I like books. I also collect spores, molds, and fungus. You seem to be a big film fan, so any particular directors you enjoy? Uh, David Lynch, David Fincher, George Romero, Dario Argento, uh, Robert Zemeckis, um, Kevin Smith, especially his earlier work, uh, Quentin Tarantino, of course, uh, Bergman, uh, Sergio Leone. Plenty of great directors out there. Uh, Stanley Kubrick. How different is your favorite album list now from when you did that video? You know, I can't even remember most of the albums that I put on that list. I mean, keep in mind, I don't watch my videos after I upload them. So, I, if I remember correctly, I think I put Disrupts Unrest on that list. I haven't listened to that album since I did that video, so... Uh, there are plenty of new albums I've discovered since then that I would say occupy my favorite albums list. Um, Slaughter in the Vatican, Disintegration, um, Ashes Against the Grain, great stuff. And, you know, I wouldn't mind doing another favorite albums list, but the thing about picking favorite albums, it's like picking favorite children. It's hard to pick, because it depends on your mood, and they're all amazing for their own different reasons. So, you know. What do you film on, and how do you edit your videos? Also, what software and equipment do you use for recording your songs? I film with an iPhone, this is currently an iPhone X, I need a newer phone, and I edit my videos with Final Cut Pro. A cracked version of it. <laughs> um, I would like to upgrade to a newer phone, I'd like to upgrade to something that isn't Final Cut, because it drives me nuts sometimes. And uh, as far as the songs go, I record with GarageBand, and I would like to upgrade to Logic. And most of the time, I use this Focusrite interface that my friend Dan got for me, and that's worked out pretty well for me. There are a few plugins that I can't use because my computer's too old, and I would like to rectify that situation pretty soon. What are some of your favorite albums and EPs from this year? The latest High on Fire album, Cometh the Storm. Holy shit. That album is a fucking monster. The way it's produced, the way the album sounds, ugh. And of course, they got the guy from Big Business to play drums for them, and he just, <clears throat> His sound is just brute force. Seriously, go listen to the new High on Fire. It rules. Fuzz General, do you play any video games? Most of what I play is pretty old. Um, like, sometimes I'll fire up an emulator and play some Super Nintendo games. I'm also a massive Doom player. I love Quake. Um, I love American McGee's Alice. Excellent stuff. So my favorite video game of all time is probably Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. But I also like stuff like Metroid, uh, Legend of Zelda, Castlevania, Symphony of the Night. That's a game that I play to relax. Um, but I'm generally not a big gamer. You know, music's been my thing, and that's... That's what I stick with, because video games are kind of expensive. So every dollar that I spend going towards video games is a dollar that I could spend towards an album. That's just the way I see it. What is your favorite poster you have? Man, there's so many posters hanging on my walls that I love. Um, I love that Cure poster I have. I love the Agalock poster I have. The Bolt Thrower posters were sent to me by Joe Bench as a thank you for doing the Bolt Thrower video back in 2017. But probably my number one favorite poster would be the Skinny Puppy VIP poster that was signed by the band because I love the size of it, and I love the little personalization of it by Ogre when he says, kill it. Yeah, so cool. Okay, thank you all for asking such great questions. Stick around for part two of this Q&A very soon. Grind on.